Hey, sixth grade. Um, I just got back from getting some some coffee from my favorite coffee shop, and uh, I, when you drink coffee, sometimes you get a lot more energy. You guys are young, so you probably don't drink coffee, but when you get older, you get tired, you feel like you hit a wall in the middle of your workday, sometimes all you need to do is drink a cup of coffee. And this place that I go to has really good coffee, and so I have a lot of energy now, and I'm in a really good mood. And as I was recording this video on the 24th chapter of Luke's Gospel, I thought to my, I got dog fur all over myself. I thought to myself, you know what? I don't think sixth grade has heard any coffee jokes yet. Uh, and I know people like Mary Angela and Chelsea and Noah and Brianna, they've all been sending me comments on Google Classroom about how much they miss having me in class and how much they miss um, all of my hilarious jokes and advice on like life issues. Um, so I think I'm going to take a minute or two at the beginning of this video to give you some coffee related jokes. Why did the coffee file a police report? Because it was mugged. That one's good. Um, how did the hipster burn his tongue? because he drank his coffee before it was cool. What do you call a sad cup of coffee? Uh, depresso. <laughs> oh man, that's, that's really good. Kevin in particular reached out to me and he's like, Mr. Bruce, I, I really need a good pickup line. And I was like, why Kevin, you're too young today. And he says, I know, but when I get to high school or college or whenever it is that I start dating, I want to have good pickup lines in the back of my mind. And I want to be able to pull them up in all kinds of situations really quickly. And I said, Kevin, that's a really wise thing to do plan for the future, but don't jump into the date into the dating game too quickly. Kevin's brother, Matthew has been asking me about that a lot lately. And I'm just like, you know what? Valentine's pump the brakes, boys. You're too young. Uh, but Kevin did ask, uh, so I thought I'd give him a coffee-related pickup line. So this is what you do when you're, when you're on a date with a lady, um, or ladies, I guess you could use this on a, on a boy too. Uh, you, you get your coffee, and you're, you sit down with them, and you're like, wow, it's been a long time since I've seen you. I really missed you a uh, latte. Pretty funny. Okay, um, we're gonna pick up where we left off on the last video. Um, so we are in the last chapter of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 24. Um, in the last video we talked about the road to Emmaus or however you pronounce it. I think it's Emmaus, that's how I've always pronounced it at least. When Jesus appears to uh, Cleopas and two of his or and, and one another disciple. Um, and then he reveals himself to them in the breaking of the bread, and then he vanishes, right? That's, that's uh, what happened in the last one. Um, so we are on slide 11 now. Yes, we're on slide 11. Um, so yes, Jesus vanishes from the meal with the disciples at Emmaus. And after he vanishes, the disciples decide to get up and go straight to Jerusalem to report to Peter and the other apostles what they saw. Um, he wants to tell the other apostles, Cleopas especially wants to tell the other apostles what happened on the road and how they didn't recognize Jesus at first, but how he explained the scriptures to them so that they didn't have to be sad or disappointed or think that Jesus failed because he died. Um, and he wants to explain all of this to the apostles. And when he gets there, it's clear that um, by this time, Jesus has already appeared to Peter. Um, so the apostles now have gone from in a single day from not believing the women in the morning 
I remember they think it's just like the women are just historic, hysterical or gossipy or whatever, uh, to towards the end of the day, uh, believing because Jesus has appeared to some of the men. Uh, toxic masculinity, I know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, Luke tells us, as they were saying this, Jesus himself stood among them and then skips ahead a little bit, but they were startled and frightened. Right, so the apostles are gathered together in Jerusalem and Jesus appears among them. And at first they think that they're seeing a ghost. This is why they're startled and frightened. They're in this room by themselves and then out of nowhere, Jesus appears. And they think it's a ghost. Um, so the church teaches that the reason that Jesus is able to kind of like teleport or whatever. He was just at Emmaus and now he's in Jerusalem and he seems to be able to pass through like solid walls, just vanish into thin air like that. The reason he's able to do this is not actually because of his divinity, although he could do this because of his divinity. Instead, the reason Jesus is able to appear and disappear from rooms like this is because of a word that uh, we don't really use in English anymore, called subtility, right? If you look this word up in a dictionary, it's going to tell you it's the same word as subtlety. And it's a very, very close relative of the word subtlety. But when we use subtility in uh, a biblical sense, it actually has a slightly different, different definition than subtlety, right? So subtility is a word we use to describe a characteristic belonging to a resurrected, glorified body. Uh, essentially what it means is that your resurrected, glorified body obeys whatever your soul commands it to do. Right? So some uh, biblical scholars, some church fathers have thought that subtility is not only going to belong to God, but is actually going to belong to all human beings in heaven when they receive their glorified bodies at the end of time. Right? So it's not something that is necessarily a divine characteristic. It just means that your soul is able to have complete command over what your body does. So much so that you could even defy laws of nature. Okay, um, so next Jesus decides, uh, well, yeah, next Jesus is going to demonstrate to his disciples that he's really physically there with his glorified resurrected body, that he's not a ghost. So he does two things. He says, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. Right? And so they, they handle Jesus, they can touch him. Then they give him, he says he's hungry, they give him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. So Jesus does two things here to show that he is physically present in a glorified, resurrected body. Right? So he invites them to touch him, and then he eats food in their presence, right? Because a ghost can't eat food. Uh, now, Jesus, of course, does not need food, right? So he's just doing this to demonstrate to them that he's physically there. And then Jesus ex explains scriptures to them. And he does this in order to show that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. So this is one of the parts in the Gospels where we have an explicit link or an explicit attempt to connect the scriptures in the Old Testament to the New Testament. Right? Jesus is showing he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. And then finally, Jesus tells them that they need to stay in the city until he sends the promise and they are clothed with power. So this is um, a reference to Jesus' promise to send the Holy Spirit to the apostles at Pentecost. All right, and finally we have the ascension. So Luke actually talks a lot more about the ascension in Acts of the Apostles. Remember our lesson on Acts chapters one through seven? In the prologue of Acts of the Apostles, the beginning of chapter one, Luke gives a more detailed account of the ascension. In chapter 24, his account of the ascension is three or four verses long. And uh, essentially, um, 
it's just like a real quick summary of what happened. So Jesus blessed them and he parted from them and was carried up into heaven and they worshiped him. Right. So why did Jesus ascend into heaven? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas gives one reason. He says, because Christ's glorified body belonged in heaven. Right. He could have remained on earth, but earth was not its natural place. Earth was kind of like a lampshade that would cover his divine glorified body. Right. Uh, the earth wouldn't limit his body in any way, but the earth doesn't really fit with his body. Right. His fit is enthroned in heaven next to the Father. So Christ belongs in perfect unity with the Father in heaven. And then by ascending into heaven, uh, this is a way for Christ to remind us that our lives on earth, even though they're important, they're precious to us, it's not what matters most, right? Because we have an eternal home with Christ in heaven if we accept it, right? And also, a final point, if Jesus remained on earth with his immortal glorified body, it would be really, really hard for people to reject Christianity. It would be so hard, in fact, that you could say people's free choice would be curtailed, their free will would be curtailed. And God is not going to interfere with our freely chosen belief in him, right? If Jesus was present on earth, we wouldn't have any atheists. Right? We wouldn't have any Jewish people or Buddhists or Muslims or Confucians, right? Everyone would basically be a Christian, right? And then we couldn't say that really people were freely choosing to believe in God because there's physical, God is physically present in his glorified body with us here on earth. So the ascension creates room for free will to be exercised. Okay, that's it for Luke chapter 24. We will close this lesson next time with John's account of the resurrection and the ascension.